I'm Jessica Stutzman and welcome back to the Mill Creek Government Channel. Founded in 1913, the Erie Philharmonic is one of the oldest orchestras in America. The mission of the Erie Philharmonic is to strengthen our community and region by providing high quality live orchestra concerts and programs that enrich, entertain, and educate people of all ages. With world-class musicians and distinguished guest artists, the 2020 season is filled with something for everyone. Joining me today to discuss the highlights of the Erie Philharmonic is Executive Director Steve Weiser. Thank you so much for joining me today. Always a pleasure to be here. Well, I love catching up with you, and um, the first thing I want to introduce our audience to, uh, without being at the Warner Theater, right. um, I want them to get to know uh, your orchestra and meet your orchestra. So right. if you could tell us um, you know, some of the individuals that make up the Erie Philharmonic and some of the instruments that are featured, right. that'll be a good start. So if you think back to some of your first sort of orchestra classes when you would have been in, in kindergarten, first and second grade, when you learned about the families of the orchestra, what starts as such an intangible idea on a poster where you see violins and cellos and bass and percussion and harp, all of those things that are on one of those posters, those turn into the families and the musicians that actually make up the Erie Phil. So while you might see a violin section on, on one of those posters, we look at it and we see our concert master, Ken Johnston, who's, uh, when you think of a concert master, he's the violin player that walks out all by himself right before the concert starts, and he's the guy that tunes the orchestra. Mm -hmm. And he's been here longer than Daniel's been here. He's been here for about almost, I think, 15 years. So you have someone like that that's almost grown up in the community a little bit. We have our principal string bass player, so he's one of the, the main faces on the right side of the stage that plays bass, that is one of our younger principals. He's been here for a couple years. He's also a music teacher at Fredonia. So all of the different people that make up the orchestra sort of make their careers in lots of different ways across the community. Some of them used to be pizza shop owners, which makes me jealous. Mm -hmm. it'd, be, it'd be pretty cool. Um, some of them used to work at the St. Mary's home. Some of them are bankers. I actually just learned the other day that one of our French horn players works at the Cleveland International Piano Competition. So uh, they definitely make their livelihood in a lot of different ways in addition to being a musician with the Erie Philharmonic. Mm -hmm. And it's been really nice the past five years now as being executive director that I had been a musician with those musicians first like I played on stage with the Erie Phil for three years so it's nice to know them as a musician and now as sort of the administrator it's nice to see our relationships grow over the last couple years absolutely that is fantastic and speaking of growing how has your presence grown within the community as well one of the biggest things we've wanted to do is to get out of the theater so many times a theater like the Warner Theater, as grand and as iconic as it can be, can sometimes be intimidating. That even if we make a concert free, it might not be the, it just might not be something that someone wants to go try. And that's what one of our biggest missions we, we've tried to do is to get out of the theater. Mm -hmm. So whether we're doing a long-term residency at one of the local preschools that we've now done, for, I think four years in a row, that we spend 60 days with one of our music educators presenting an in-school residency to these preschools students. We've done a lot of work at Celebrate Erie, one of the big festivals over the summer where we bring an instrumental petting zoo, where if you walk by our tent, you can pick up a violin and play it. Mm -hmm. And it's really, really cool. It's, it's one of the neatest things that, that we've really grown to do. And then this past summer, we did a three concert residency up in Northeast, where we literally took the orchestra out of the, out of the theater, out of the city, and plopped them in a park. And for three weeks in a row, we did these incredible outdoor concerts. And when you, when you go to do a free performance outside, you, you never know if anyone's going to come. Mm -hmm. You hope that everyone's going to come, but you're always afraid that six people are going to come. <laughs> and for that, I'd say about seven to 800 people came to every concert. Wow. And we literally filled up the park in Northeast. We did a small chamber orchestra with Daniel conducting, our music director. We did a brass quintet and then a group of eight musicians doing sort of a little pops concert. And it was amazing. And we, we really, it's something that we're really dedicated to. So this year, we're looking to go back to Northeast for four concerts. Mm -hmm. We're starting to plan those things now. And it's, it's something we believe in. We have a mission statement that has three words, enrich, entertain, and educate. And we really believe in doing those. Mm -hmm. And we can't do a lot of enrichment if we can't get out of the community and reach people where they are. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm sure it was so much fun seeing those preschoolers, seeing their faces light up when they got to see some of those instruments played so close to them, you know, and being able to exactly. interact with that musician. The neatest thing we do is we, we sort of, 
in addition to like reading language skills and brain-based movement where they're learning how to hop on one, one foot and say a word and memorize things, so it's a lot of preschool, like kindergarten readiness training, they get instrument days mm -hmm. where there's a percussion petting zoo day where I get to come in and dust off my percussion chops mm -hmm. and I get to bring in percussion instruments for the, for the students. Mm -hmm. So any of the, the students get to actually try a snare drum, try the bongos, try a cymbal. And then one of the best things is tuba day where a little six-year-old gets to, to try to play a tuba. Mm -hmm. And when they put the mouthpiece up to their mouth, sometimes it's as big as their head. Mm -hmm. It really is, it's one of the cutest things you see. Their eyes light up when they can actually make a sound out of an instrument that's six times as big as they are. Yeah, it's absolutely. Um, and you have had some, a really exciting year. And what I want our audience um, to know is that you were able to work with some soloists who were Grammy nominated and, um, and Grammy winners recently. So right. can you touch on that for us? Sure, so one of the most recent performances we had was our sold out presentation of West Side Story um, in the middle of January. And our featured guest artist was a young violinist named Tessa Lark. And we were a handful of a few orchestras that commissioned a composer, Michael Torkey, to write a violin concerto specifically for Tessa. So when you commission a composer to write a new piece of music, you sort of get exclusive rights to perform that piece of music first. And it turns out, uh, one of the orchestras that actually premiered the work recorded it, and that piece was nominated for a Grammy. So Tessa and her performance of the piece was Grammy nominated, and it was, it, I, I think we're sort of first cousin once removed to a Grammy mm -hmm. in the fact that we were that close to it. Mm -hmm. So she was Grammy nominated. Coming up on April 4th, we're doing Beethoven's Ninth Symphony to sort of conclude our season, and that, that's the big Ode to Joy Symphony where you need a chorus, 200 musicians on stage. One of our soloists, the baritone soloist, Mark Stephen Doss, is a Grammy winner. And then back in November, we had the great bass player, Edgar Meyer was here. Mm -hmm. And Edgar Meyer, I think, has won six or seven Grammys, depending on what website you check out. Mm -hmm. But he was here, um, he was up at WQM Studios, did an incredible performance at the Warner Theater, but he also was a Grammy winner. So it's, it's part of our dedication that we want to put on the best concerts that you can possibly imagine. You don't have to travel to Pittsburgh or Cleveland. You can go down the street and see Grammy winners perform with the Erie Philharmonic right here in town. And that's, it's really special to see the, to see the musicians on stage interact and enjoy it just as much as the audience does. Mm -hmm. And how do you connect with those folks who are Grammy winners? I would think they would be hard to get a hold of. A lot of times it's you throw every dart possible and see what sticks. Okay. And sometimes we have personal connections with myself growing up in the music business, um, being a music student, spending four summers at the Aspen Music Festival. I have a lot of contacts or at least memory of musicians that I saw there. So if I need to reach out to an agent as executive director, but I can leave off with. I spent the summer in Aspen and I had a chance to see Edgar when he was a bass soloist there. I would love to find a way to bring him to Erie. Mm -hmm. Introducing the story like that really, really helps sort of get them on your side. Mm -hmm. And then talking about what we're doing here, that we're a city on the comeback, we're a city on the rise, the orchestra is better than it's ever been before, we would like you to come be a part of this. Mm -hmm. And nine out of ten chances, the right people that we would want to come here are the people that say yes. Mm -hmm. So it almost sort of self-selects. When you get a Grammy winner that happens to be one of the nicest people on the planet, that's how they end up coming here because they want to be a part of the story. Mm -hmm. And then hopefully there's a snowball effect with that too. And then yeah. you can keep, you know, moving forward and, and, and getting more and more. It definitely helps when you can put a picture on Facebook where it's the orchestra and a sold out performance with one famous guest artist. Mm -hmm. Because then when his friends see those pictures on Facebook, they'll understand, oh, if Eerie Phil calls and asks me to come, I know at least that the community will come out, that they'll mm -hmm. support it. And I know that as an artist, I'll get to do some meaningful educational outreach programs. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of, it's, it's doing the right thing and collecting the data and telling people about it, that if we bring a Grammy winner to an elementary school, making sure we just get a couple pictures of him standing with 200 smiling kids, mm -hmm. because then when I need to go to the next guest artist, I can prove that we have our act together and mm -hmm. we're actually, we, we believe in what we say we do mm -hmm. and we'll do it. 
Oh, that's absolutely, that's awesome. That's so yes. incredible. Um, and something really exciting you have going on is your virtual orchestra project. So what can the community look forward to this year as compared to last year? So last year we sort of launched the first version of it, which is you can put on a 3D headset mm -hmm. and it's like you're sitting in the middle of the stage. And if you haven't tried it, it, it's very hard to describe without just putting the headset on and doing it. But basically it would be like if we put you in a chair in the middle of the Warner Theater stage in the middle of a concert. Mm -hmm. So when you look up, you see music director Daniel Meyer right in front of you. When you look to your right and your left, there's a musician this close to you. Mm -hmm. So that was version one. We recorded one piece about a year and a half ago. With some very generous grant funding, we were able to record another piece of music. So uh, this past November, we recorded the epic Pines of Rome, which is, it was featured in Fantasia. When you think of big epic movie music, that's it. Mm -hmm. That will now be showing up in the virtual reality headsets in the next few months. And then we're working with senior design students from Penn State Behrend to make us the first ever conduct along guitar hero video game. So you'll be able to put on a 3D headset, hold onto a joystick, and actually learn how to conduct by following a moving ball on the screen right in front of the virtual world that you're in. So you're gonna be able to conduct along with some eerie Philhar philharmonic music, some archive music, and you'll literally be able to learn how to conduct in 3D. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's coming soon. We're hoping that'll be ready to go by May or June of this year. And then we're working on a few new uh, upgrades to the technology where instead of needing the case that we have to travel around with, all of the virtual reality videos can be included just in a single headset. Mm -hmm. So when we go to visit a school, uh, hearkening back to the, the poster I talked about earlier, rather than these students having to learn about an orchestra by a poster on the wall, we can put on one of these headsets and they can learn about the orchestra from literally sitting in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. And it's it's a lot of fun to see. We, we did a school, uh, school of tours last year to Grover Cleveland and every single third grader had a chance to try virtual reality and we're hoping to do it again in the coming months. And I think that's so neat to pair the two because you always know that children love technology right. and they love their, their iPads and virtual reality and video games and you're you're meshing that with music, right, exactly. which I think every parent wants their child to be involved with. So I think the two connecting right. um, really you know, helps you know, keep keep their attention and, and, and right. fosters that excitement. It does, and you, you hope to think that one or two of the things could be the spark that turns into whatever drives that young child forward. Mm -hmm. Whether they have a love for music and become a trumpet player in their band, or whether they want to go the technology route and then become a coder, we'd like to think that this program could have a, any one of those possible sparks. That whether they go into music or not, it's going to instill some new level of excitement mm -hmm. that they maybe wouldn't have had normally at their school. Mm -hmm. How difficult is it to produce this, uh, do you have to do a lot of different takes with the orchestra? I mean, how what all goes into making this happen on the virtual reality end? So the, the trick is, is we, we get one shot. Oh, okay. We, we set up during a live concert and we record it. Okay, so you're not doing take after take after nope, take. Nope, you, you do it all once, and that mm -hmm. that's sort of a testament to how good the musicians of the Erie Phil are, mm -hmm. to know that if we record a concert, 99 out of 100 times, that take is gonna be perfect. Mm -hmm. And mercifully, it worked out right. They, they, didn't, they didn't prove me wrong with mm -hmm. being the one out of 100. Yeah. The, the performance we did of Pines of Rome was an absolute magical performance. The whole thing was captured on video. And because it's a live concert, you sort of get that atmosphere and almost that feeling of adrenaline. Mm -hmm. That if you're in a recording studio, it's a little hard to emulate versus being live on stage playing for 2,000 people. That gives you a sense of energy that you can then capture in these 3D cameras. Mm -hmm. And then as an audience member putting on the headset, you can experience that live concert because you're surrounded by those musicians and seeing how excited they are. Do, do the musicians, again, who have been playing for a couple years or decades, do they still feel that adrenaline rush when they get on the stage or perform in front of the live audience? As far as I know from talking to them, they always do. Okay. Especially when you see a sold out crowd. Mm -hmm. From when I used to be a musician with the orchestra, I know what it feels like to walk on stage and see 600 people there. Mm -hmm. And in a hall that can sit about 2,200, 600 might as well be two. Mm -hmm. It's a very small number. So th that's a feeling that musicians definitely interact with that every single time there's a concert. Mm -hmm. And it's contagious. And when you walk on stage like we did um, in the middle of January for that sold out show, 
even just when you make the pre-concert announcement that says, welcome to tonight's sold out performance, mm -hmm. the audience always claps, you always hear murmuring in the crowd. And as a musician, you definitely feel that. It, mm -hmm. It's palpable. Mm -hmm. And I know whether you've been in the orchestra for 50 years or, or two months, that's something you feel. And that's where the sense of community on stage with everyone sort of rowing together at the same time, you really feel it. I love that. I love that buzz, that excitement. It's fun. So, um, and again, we just we keep talking about kids, and I, and I love kids in music. So, what I want to talk about next is the the junior philharmonic. Right. How students and children can get involved, and what are their age groups, and what does that look like? So, we've sort of revamped the junior philharmonic over the past few years to take it from what was sort of a premier one group ensemble, and have now turned it into a, an organization with multiple ensembles geared towards any single skill level. Whether you're a senior that's going off to music school and you're in the top symphony orchestra, or you're someone that's walked off the street and wants to learn how to play a violin at age five, we have a program for you. Mm -hmm. And that's something that's really been new over the past couple years. And one of the best examples I can give is two years ago at Celebrate Erie, where we had one of our instrumental petting zoos, a young girl walked up off the street, had never played an instrument before, and she tried a violin for the first time ever. And she loved it. So at that table at Celebrate Erie, we had the ability to sign up for our new ensemble, uh, Prelude Strings. And it's designed for people that have never played an instrument before. So she played an instrument at the petting zoo, loved it, signed up to try the Junior Phil program, became a member of the Junior Phil after one year, and then that next year, she was back at Celebrate Erie doing a petting zoo for the next round of kids. Aww. And it happened just this past summer. We have pictures of her when she showed up the first year, and then pictures of her this past summer where she was working with the next round of kids. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it really is amazing to see the, the growth that the kids can have as part of this ensemble. But we have ensembles for every age group, whether you've never played an instrument before, we have instruments to give you and the ability to teach you how to play it, versus the top level students that um, this coming March will be able to do a side-by-side -side performance where they'll actually play on stage with the Erie Phil as part of one of our concerts. Mm -hmm. What a nice story. That's really, you know, to see that come full circle, that has to make you feel good. It's the kind of thing you write a grant about that you hope would happen, mm -hmm. and it doesn't It doesn't happen that often. Mm -hmm. So to see it actually happen and then to have the documentation of all the pictures of it, it's... It